this is our first event after summer break and after the opening of our exhibition and is uh, the fifth, I think, uh, conversation uh, of our series about exile and creativity. We start last uh, February um, and Tonight, we have a panel discussion uh, that explores the experience of two Italian artists, Corrado Cagli and Costantino Nivola, who fled fascist Italy for America. Costantino Nivola and Corrado Cagli uh, are more or less the same age, but um, came from very different backgrounds. Nivola from Rural Sardinia was the son of a Mason. Uh, Cagli from Ancona in Rome was born into an urban and assimilated Jewish family. Um, while Cagli was integrated into the fascist cultural world, Nivola remained in the background and was hired as graphic designer at Olivetti. In 1938, the promulgation of the Russian laws, and I want to um, uh, remember you that la uh, next week on Tuesday we will have uh, a discussion about La Storia by Elsa Morante uh, in the occasion of the uh, 80th, 80th uh, annivers uh, anniversary of the promulgation of Russian Rose. Um, after appunto, the promulgation of the Russian Rose, uh, they uh, left uh, Italy uh, and go uh, went to America. Cagli had become uh, an outcast because of his Jewishness and Nivola had frictions with the regime due to his anti-fascist leanings. He had also married a German Jewish woman, Ruth Guggenheim, and left Italy with her. In their new country, uh, Cagli and Nivola found themselves among uh, exiled artists from various countries like Gropius, Alberts, uh, Breuer, Moholinaghi, Balanchine, Rieti, Steinberg, and many, many others. Cagli joins the ranks of the U.S. Army where he confronts the horrors of the war and the Shoah. Nivola mingles with other anti-fascist exiles, the like of Modigliani, Toscanini, Salvemini, uh, and Borgese. During their exile, Costantino Nivola and Corrado Cagli, each one in his own way, acted as cultural bridges between their country of origin and the US. After the war, Cagli went back to Italy while Nivola remained in the state until his death. Um, to speak about these two uh, great and, and very interesting artists, we have tonight uh, Julian Altea, who will speak about uh, Costantino Nivola. Uh, Julian Altea is an associate professor at the University of Sassari. The main focus of her research is on Italian art and applied arts on, of the first half of the 20th century and on the relationship between architecture and visual arts after World War II and on artistic exchanges between Italy and the United States. Following her studies on one of the protagonists of this movement, Costantino Nivola, uh, on which he has published an extensive monograph with Antonella Camarda, Altea became president of the Nivola Foundation. In this role, in addition to creating with Antonella Camarda and Richard Ingersoll the new project of the Nivola Museum in Orani, Sardinia, she continued to explore the role of Nivola in the transatlantic scenario of the synthesis of the arts. Raffaele Bedarida, who will speak about Corrado Cagli, holds a PhD from the Art History Department of the CUNY Graduate Center, as well as MA and BA degrees in Art History from the Università degli Studi di Siena. He is an art historian and curator specializing in art, politics, and cultural diplomacy between Europe and America. His publication has focused on Italian modernism from futurism to arte povera in the international context. Since 2008, when he founded and created the res residency program Harlem Studio Fellowship in New York, 
it has actively promoted programs of international exchange for emerging artists. After three years and an adjunct, Bidarida joined Cooper Union full-time faculty in September 2016. So welcome, Giuliana Altea and Raffaele Bidarida, please. First, I would like to thank the Instituto Italiano di Cultura and uh, Giorgio Van Straten for organizing this event and for inviting me. I think that uh, exile and creativity is a very good thing to look at, at the, the work of an artist such as Costantino Nivola, because uh, in his case, the transformative value of exile is particularly clear. Uh, for him, uh, for him uh, exile uh, not only had uh, powerful effects uh, on his development as an artist, but also also um, prompted a, a process of identity building uh, made more complicated by the fact that uh, in his case uh, the move to New York uh, was uh, the last in a long series of uh, displacement and the relocation from the countryside to the city, from uh, Sardinia to Italy, then, uh, then to Europe. So I think that uh, uh, Nivola's story is a very good example of that process of uh, rewriting the self, uh, which has been identified as, uh, uh, as a result, a frequent result of, uh, of migration, of, uh, of uprooting. Until a few years ago, scholars who looked at uh, Nivola's uh, work uh, uh, tend to overlook uh, uh, this moment. They concentrated uh, on uh, his encounter with Le Corbusier and uh, on his discovery of sculpture. But uh, in so doing, they practically rubbed off 10 years, uh, 10 very important years uh, in, in his career, in, in his art and in his life. So this is our artist, uh, rather attractive, as you can see. Uh, Nivola was born uh, in 1911 to a very poor family in Orani, a village in Inner Sardinia, a rural village. Until the age of 14, he worked uh, with his father, a mason. Then uh, he followed as an apprentice the local painter Mario Delitala to Sassari, a nearby city. Uh, in 1931, uh, a, a small grant enabled him to study graphic design at the ISEA in Monza, the High Institute for Artistic Industries. Uh, from there, he moved to Milan, where, thanks uh, to one of his masters, Giuseppe Pagano, a leading figure in modernist Italian architecture, he got involved uh, in several officially sponsored exhibitions, such as uh, the Triennale in the 19th 36 Triennale in Milan, uh, the Italian Pavilion at the International Exposition in Paris in 1937, and uh, by, by 1936 he also had been hired as art director at the Olivetti's Publicity Office uh, in Milan. But uh, as um, uh, Giorgio Van Straten reminded us Nivola was an anti-fascist. He was in contact uh, with the clandestine association Justizia and Libertà. He married uh, a Jewish woman, Ruth Guggenheim, unfortunately not those Guggenheims. And uh, he, um, so he had to, to leave Italy for Paris first and finally for the US. Um, in this drawing from 1944, uh, Nivola recalls uh, with a mix of bitterness and self-irony his uh, experience as a, and his exile, as a, his experience of exile, um, the sense of, uh, uh, of estrangement of the newcomer, uh, uh, the wall of incomprehension separating him from this uh, uh, American police officer. Look at also at uh, this uh, alien-like green complexion signaling his difference from what surrounds him. However, um, however, in the drawings doesn't tell the whole story because in 1944 the worst phase of his exile had, uh, was already over and a series of happy events uh, had begun. Uh, later in life, Nivola would have recalled the same experience in a rosy light. He wrote, uh, I knocked at the doors of this unbelievable city and a thousand doors, windows and hearts opened. The customs officer was perplexed by my luggage made of naivete youth talent, and foreign accent. 
after some difficult months, in 1940, Nivola was hired as art director at uh, uh, Interiors, uh, which was uh, a rather conservative magazine then, but soon became an influential design publication. Nivola redesigned its layout. Uh, he pushed to update its content by introducing the work of uh, important uh, emigre architects such as uh, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Josep Louis Sert. He also worked for another uh, monthly, architectural monthly, Pencil Point, for the fashion magazine U and other publications. The interior's layout uh, are uh, indebted uh, to the Milanese architectural magazine Casabella, uh, whose graphic uh, image had been designed by another of Nivola's masters, uh, um, Eduardo Persico, and uh, to Domus, uh, with which uh, Nivola occasionally collaborated. However, to achieve recognition in the American editorial market, Nivola played up the card of European identity more than that of his Italian origins, for example, taking inspiration from surrealism and not a particularly popular movement in Italy. Even before, his Raoul Dufy-inspired drawings had led him to be nicknamed the Little Berard. Berard was a famous French illustrator. This uh, European image uh, was reinforced by his contact with the milieu of emigre artists who met at the Jumbo Shop, uh, a club in the Greenwich Village where Leger and Mondrian socialized with American artists such as Gorky, Hoffman, and Calder. However, to both uh, the emigres and uh, the Americans, Nivola invariably appeared as a Sardinian. Messier Nivola Sardinian was how uh, Joseph Louis Sert introduced him to Le Corbusier in 1946. Uh, in fact, uh, um, although his time in Milan uh, had been until then the happiest phase in his life, Nivola tended to downplay it, emphasizing, in contrast, uh, his Sardinian origins. Later on, uh, surrounding himself uh, uh, with objects of Sardinian handicrafts, uh, posing for the camera in the velvet suite traditionally worn by the shepherd of his island. Letting, uh, letting the memory of his own roots emerge was the normal response of the exile to situation of alienation. Nivola worked uh, as an art director uh, three days a week. The rest of his time was reserved for painting, which uh, he considered his true vocation. But uh, in painting, uh, though he was going uh, through a serious crisis uh, right then. Uh, because in Milan, uh, the city of the Olivetti, the Triennale, the Fair, uh, where the boundaries between pure decorative art were much less clear than in America, he was seen as a promising young graphic designer, but he was also a practicing painter. His experience of Italian official exhibitions uh, had habituated him to work in team, not to see ambitious art and uh, commissions for industries as, as mutually incompatible tasks. In America, it was different. Here, uh, here uh, Clement Greenberg theories had uh, deepened the divide between high and low, between avant-garde and kitsch. Here, Nivola found himself defined as a commercial artist, a label with a strongly limitative uh, meaning. Uh, this uh, destroyed his self-esteem and generated a strong sense of inferiority fed by his relationship with the emigre masters and with his colleagues from the New York School. His works uh, from the 40s are all about identity. Um, about the trauma of exile, about the encounter with the new culture. In 1943, he registered his own reaction to the cityscape of New York in a series of drawings in which figures and buildings are described with this uh, obsessive accumulation of detail. They become grotesque and surreal, incoherent and absurd. Uh, the drawings pick up both the latent uh, dehumanization of a culture dominated by consumption and the energy transmitted by the incessant flow of life. In his exploration of uh, New York, uh, Nivola was often in company with Saul Steinberg. The two had met in Milan in the 30s, and uh, when uh, he arrived in America, Steinberg immediately got in touch with Nivola and they became close friends. Nivola's graphic style uh, is influenced by Steinberg's in its uh, clear line, in its uh, sense of detail. 
However, however, the hallucinated and exaggeratedly dense figuration is only volas. The proliferation of detail conveys the vertigo of the excess of new information, which is perceived as chaos. As William Flusser wrote, uh, exile is uh, an ocean of chaotic information. By the middle of the 40s, uh, the vision of the city as an indecipherable spectacle gave way to that of the city as a background for the staging of a search for self, and then gradually the city as a place of achieved social and cultural integration. From the chaotic cityscapes of 1943, we pass to a series of tempera paintings uh, depicting the artist as exile lost in the heart of the metropolis. Finally, in a view of Times Square from 1946, Nivola replicated a similar painting from three years earlier with the significant addition of himself, his wife Ruth, and their son Pietro, the picti were getting ready to cross the street. We can see them on the right. One American family among many, it is with the traffic and the noise of Manhattan. The childlike, almost, uh, almost cartoon-like style of these works again remind us of Steinberg's, but it can also be read as a reflection of the exile's symbolical regression to childhood. Being an immigrant made, uh, made you become a child again, said Steinberg and Nivola. When one arrives in America, he must restart from the beginning. This means to go back to one's childhood, to be reborn. The image of uh, isolation and existential drift evoked by the works from the mid 40s should not be taken as a, an accurate portrayal of the artist's life because uh, at, uh, at this moment Nivola was uh, already part of a dense uh, uh, network of human and social relationships. Uh, uh, Peter Blake, then curator of the architectural department uh, at MoMA, in his memoir, uh, refers to him as uh, the heart of that small avant-garde world that gathered in Manhattan in the 40s. He describes uh, the Wednesday lunches presided over by him at the Del Pezzo restaurant as a regular hangout of artists and intellectuals, American and foreigners. Nivola's central place uh, in the Manhattan avant-garde was of a social and not of an artistic nature. In the early 40s, he moved easily among working-class Italian-American anarchists and Italian intellectual refugees, editorial circles, publicity agency, emigre artists and architects. He was close to many of the future protagonists of the New York school, such as Pollock and De Kooning. Here you can see him with Pollock and, and Lee Krasner and was also close to the intellectuals gathered around the leftist magazine Politics. This is the cover designed by him. Uh, starting with the um, politics editor Dwight MacDonald and with the radical and libertarian thinker Nicola Chiaromonte. Around this time, two events brought a change to Nivola life, to Nivola's life. One was uh, his encounter with Le Corbusier, uh, in, whom he met in 1946 when the architect was in New York as a member of the international team in charge of designing the United Nations buildings. And the other event was Nivola's first trip to Italy after the war. Le Corbusier's influence on Nivola is well known. The artist never tired of uh, speaking uh, of him as the mentor who initiated him to modernism, explaining him the laws uh, of form. By the way, this was a rather funny claim if one thinks that, after all, Nivola was a professional designer, uh, graphic designer who had been in moving in modernist circles since the age of 20. However, much has been made of this relationship with Le Corbusier, but less attention has been paid to, to the influence uh, with that, uh, that Le Corbusier had on Nivola's search for identity. Nivola's friendship with the man who regarded as an ocean of knowledge, his words, a man who must have never doubted his own identity, improved uh, Nivola's self-confidence. Corbu also refreshed the, the interest for blurring the artistic boundaries that Nivola had absorbed in Italy. Uh, Le Corbusier, um, besides being an architect, was also a painter and a sculptor. Uh, last but not least, his lessons vaccinated Nivola against the lure of the new American avant-garde, whose lack of control and rationality the architect condemned. 
So when starting experimenting with modernist styles, Nivola looked at the European sources, Cubism and Surrealism, Le Corbusier's and Leger's paintings. The result of this effort uh, are a number of works that the artist himself considered as formal exercises rather than artworks in their own right. <clears throat> However, before setting this uh, stylistic reform, Nivola had to come to terms uh, with his relationship with Italy. In 1947, he traveled to Europe to explore the possibility of a definitive return to Milan, but after four months, he decided against leaving the States. Going back to Italy, that country so defective and so charming, would have been an admission of defeat, the choice of a simpler and more pleasant life, as opposed to the challenge represented by New York. Conversely, this decision strengthened his attachment to Italy and above all to Sardinia. He became an active mediator between Italy and the US, a role that started with the publication of graphic reportages on Italy in interiors and Harper's Bazaar, and of some of the 1943 New York drawings in Domus, then directed by an old friend from Milan, the architect Ernesto Nathan Rogers uh, of the BBPR studio. Having chosen to stay in the US, Nivola bought a house, an old farm in Springs, Long Island, in an area that was at the time a cheap place of holiday for artists. This was his first real home after the series of diminutive lodgings that had been his abode in New York. Uh, refurbished by himself, furnished with a few pieces of his own make and with objects brought from Sardinia, the house was to become uh, the symbol of his new identity as an artist, a sort of substitute for his homeland, and above all, a work in progress in which to experiment the continuity of art and life. The center of the house was the modernist garden that Nivola designed with the architect Bernard Rudowski, an Austrian emigre who in the 30s had been in Italy collaborating with Gio Ponti and, and writing for Domus. Rudowski, Rudowski saw architecture as a way of living, um, as a search for simplicity and harmony based on the example of Mediterranean culture. Nivola shared this vision, which drew from his master Pagano's precept of modesty and from Pagano's study of vernacular architecture. The garden was a series of open-air rooms connected by vine pergolas, the former a theme already treated by Rudowski, the latter an element of traditional Mediterranean architecture uh, present in Orani and familiar, familiar to Nivola. In the garden, in the garden there were fireplaces, benches, a solarium inspired by Le Corbusier surrealist roof terrace in Charles Bestegui apartment in Paris, independent walls to define the spaces. On these walls, Nivola painted murals, looking at Le Corbusier example, but also at the New York School's interest for the expansion of painting beyond its frame, and in Peter Blake's project for Pollock's Ideal Museum, for the use of painting as an element for dividing spaces. Here you see Pollock uh, and, uh, and Blake in front of the model, and uh, as you can see, uh, painting are used to divide the, the space. Um, the garden was the theater of Nivola's conversion to sculpture, a profession for settled people, so he said, sculpture had been incompatible with this previous nomadic condition. Playing with his children on the Long Island beach, Nivola discovered the sand casting, a simple technique uh, for making reliefs in plaster or concrete from a sand mold. The earlier sand casts are disturbing primitive totems, combining surrealist echoes from Earth and Giacometti with the Sardinian prehistoric sculpture. Like the murals, periodically painted over and replaced by others, the sculptures were frequently changed or moved, so the artworks were inserted in the cycle of life and at the same time reflected the search for a balance between permanence and impermanence, the tension between the exile sense of instability and the ease of feeling eventually at home. 
This tension is at the center of Nivola's subsequent work. On one hand, we find, we find this uh, desire for permanence and monumentality. On the other hand, his inclination for light and spontaneous technique, and uh, as we will see, for somewhat immaterial forms of expression. In 1954, the success of his relief uh, in the Olivetti showroom in the Fifth Avenue, designed by the BBPRs, initiated his career as a sculptor for architecture, attracting many important commissions. Applied to architecture, Sandka's sculpture tended to identify with the building, yet retaining an undeniable monumental quality. Under the sign of permanence uh, is Nivola's interest uh, for the theme of construction, uh, his constant uh, reference to his father the Mason and to the Nuraghi, the prehistoric Sardinian towers. On the other side, the garden was uh, a convivial place where creative exploration became part of everyday activities. Visiting friends such as Le Corbusier and Bruno Munari, and occasionally also the artist family, were involved in the making of art. So the garden was an incubator for a line of work moving from the materiality of the object to the social and community context. And the crucial example here is the Pergola village, a 1953 project for Orani, Nivola's native village, in which the artist imagined to connect all the houses, uh, one to each other, with vine pergolas, transforming the streets into spaces for collective use. The only uncovered space was to be the central plaza where a monument to the Mason of Orani had to be placed. The project harks back to the uh, early stage of Nivola's exile, to conversations he had in 1942 with the anti-fascist leader Emilio Lussu. In Nivola's utopian plans for post-war Sardinia, all the houses would have been connected by white painting and the blue bays as a symbol of the social ties. The Pergola village belongs uh, to a series of uh, unrealized projects for monuments for celebrating life, including a great stove with many fires to cook special food, a labyrinth full of visual surprises. In this model, uh, they are both combined, uh, um, labyrinth and stove. And uh, a musical fountain to be assembled by the owners in different ways. This project, uh, some of uh, which could be defined as a relational art ante literam, sprang in part from the will of enhancing life and the myth of community, and in part from his experience of exile. The idea of enhancing life that he shared with Rudowski came from a line of Viennese modernist thought based on the idea of art as a way of living. The utopian ideal of community life was indebted to Joseph Louis Serre's core of the city, a monumental center surrounded by covered streets capable of fostering collective life. It was also indebted to Adriano Olivetti, who Nivola had resumed contact with, the, with in 1947, when the forward-looking entrepreneur was working out his idea of community as the basis for democratic life. And finally, he uh, was indebted to Nicola Chiaromonte's utopian view. Mary McCarthy, one of the politics contributors, uh, uh, speaking of the summer spent with Chiaromonte at Cape Cod, in which also Nivola participated, wrote, it seemed still possible, utopian but possible, to change the world on a small scale. To change the world on a, on a small scale is an idea cherished in recent years by relational art, but it was, it was also Nivola's idea. It was also his uh, uh, project, uh, the project of his garden and his monument for celebrating life. So, summing up, from 1950 on, we find in Nivola's work a unique combination of Italian rationalism, Mediterranean civilization, and Sardinian tradition, Le Corbusian influence, uh, Viennese influence, a suggestion from the New York School, Serre's view on urbanism, Olivetti's social thought, and Chiaromonte's utopian imagination. The experience of exile, the search for identity it fostered, was what led him to merge all these themes in an original vision. Thank you. So thank you. I want to thank uh, Giorgio Van Straten and uh, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura for inviting me. Uh, I also want to thank Alessandro Cassin and uh, Natalia Andrimi of the Centro Primo Levi for uh, being uh, important key promoter of this uh, idea. Um, I'm not going to talk about one artist, but two. I decided to uh, 
uh, combine, and um, um, they are uh, Corrado Cagli and uh, Lucio Fontana. It's uh, an un unlikely uh, comparison, but I hope to make a case uh, for talking about them uh, um, together. So um, I'll start uh, in 1947 uh, by comparing uh, the experience of these uh, two Italian artists, uh, Lucio Fontana, which you see here on the left, and uh, uh, Corrado Cagli on the right. I mean, this is a work by Corrado Cagli, uh, who had spent uh, the Second World War abroad, um, Fontana in Argentina and uh, uh, Cagli in the United States. And then they returned to their studio in Italy, uh, Fontana in Milan and uh, Cagli in Rome. Both studios uh, had been destroyed by Allied bombs during the war, but the strategy with which each artist engaged with the recent war and uh, with the fascist past could not be uh, more different. Also, the reception that they received in Italy uh, was uh, the extreme opposites. Um, so, in the first part, and it's, it's going to be three parts, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Fontana's return to Italy and uh, his strategy dealing with the recent past. Um, many of us in the room probably uh, knew already uh, this uh, photograph, which uh, depicts uh, the artist as he emerges from the rubbles of his studio in Milan. Um, as I said, it had been just destroyed. And it is one of the most iconic and most often reproduced images of post-war Italian art. But uh, it's not an isolated uh, case. Uh, it's actually part of uh, a ubiquitous uh, series of representations of ruins used to depict Italy in the post-war years, like in countless other images of the period, like in Rossellini movies. Here we have two images from uh, uh, Paisa and uh, uh, Life magazine. Uh, here is uh, uh, a photo article dedicated to Italy. Uh, the emphasis is on the people inhabiting uh, those rubbles and emerging from them. Art too recurs in these representations. Monuments from the past are literally framed by the ruins and emerging from them, as you see in both uh, frames uh, of uh, um, Rossellini, as well as uh, in, the, uh, in the article here in um, Life magazine. In a landscape of destruction, the juxtaposition of artworks from the past and living Italians came to signify Italy's physical and spiritual rebirth after the devastation of the war. They confirmed uh, philosopher Benedetto Croce's post-war description of fascism as a closed parenthesis. The implied message was that the Italians were now finding a new life, which was rooted in the past and in their great artistic legacy across the interruption of the dictatorship. A fortunate phrase in the post-war years was that Italy was experiencing a new renaissance uh, after the fall of Mussolini. Representation of living artists uh, resuming their activities inhabited the same semantic sphere of national regeneration. Here, here on the left you see this was again from Life magazine and you have the studios of uh, Mirko and uh, Guttuso and other artists in Rome next to an article dedicated to freedom and the rebirth uh, of cultural life in the city. So Fontana's photo, uh, which we know was carefully staged, is part of a series. There is one when Fontana touches the wall, another one when he holds a piece of the rubble, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the one that then he chose to publish and make uh, well known. Uh, depicts the artist in the act of uh, leaving his ruined studio. He descends from a mound of rubbles that are covering his old work. The rubbles play an important multifaceted role as signifiers of destruction and poverty. They contribute to the redemptive rhetoric typical of the post-war moment, emphasizing trauma but also showing the Italian's ability to find dignity despite material adversity. Simultaneously, as index of uh, tabula rasa, the ruins conveniently bury both memory and responsibility of the recent past, and they create the perfect terrain for the myth of the so-called zero hour, a future to be built from scratch. 
Now, today, uh, Fontana is best known for works like his uh, cat canvases here reproduced on the left, which are from uh, the 1960s. But in the immediate post-war moment, people mostly remember him for his fascist monuments, like here, uh, the Sala della Vittoria, which celebrated the conquest uh, of Ethiopia in 1936. This was uh, in the uh, Triennale uh, in Milan. And this is uh, a detail to show you, you know, the, the, the size, the, the, uh, the scale uh, of the work. After having spent the war years in Argentina, Fontana reappeared on the Milanese art scene as the prophet of a new era. He arrived with the Manifiesto Blanco, here is uh, the cover, under his arm, um, which starting from the word white uh, of the title, the Manifesto promised a tabula rasa. And the text too used the futurist-like tones and announced uh, a new kind of art of a, for a new era in which new technologies, scientific discoveries, and artistic practice became one. Fontana's work uh, of the post-war years functioned like our initial photo in the sense that they balanced base materiality of rubbles uh, like in his uh, atomic man here reproduced um, on, the li uh, on the left, with the blankness of the pristine field of action. Like uh, this is one of the first uh, punctured canvases that he did in the late 40s. The exhilarating effect was to conflate the tangible rubbles of the war and the potential rubbles of the post-atomic future. The pristine surface of the moon, uh, this is one of uh, the puncture canvases on the left, and the rubbles of uh, outer space. Uh, this is uh, an environment uh, that Fontana famously did in 1949 uh, with the suspended uh, uh, objects made out of papier mache and the black light. So people would enter this dark environment with the suspended object and all they saw were those volumes, their teeth, and uh, sh white shirts if they were wearing one. Um, so, uh, the, um, so it, um, they, they, you, it conflated this kind of uh, uh, um, different kinds of, uh, of rubbles um, which were suspended without gravity and uh, uh, without uh, a past. Um, so well rooted uh, in his art from the fascist period, Fontana's post-war work was especially successful because it made it possible for his public to stare back at the fascist past with comfort through a protective screen or a blinding light. Especially this, is what, this was his famous uh, neon intervention for the Triennale in 1951, which not only was the same place where he had made uh, his uh, fascist work, but also was one of the iconic fascist buildings from uh, the 1930s. In uh, the post-war years, Fontana rescued some of the most ambitious utopias of fascist art from the synthesis of the art, combining architecture and design and sculpture, etc., to the conquest of uh, outer space. Uh, here on the left is uh, a futurist work by, Corrado, uh, by sorry, uh, Fortunato De Pero showing astronauts as they are having a conversation while uh, flying, uh, flying to the moon. So he's uh, rescuing these uh, uh, fascist utopias while at the same time convincing the public that he was all about the future. It is not by chance that uh, the fortune of Fontana that Fontana enjoyed in the post-war years in Italy, Germany, and Japan has no equivalent in the United States, despite various attempts uh, to promote his work in this country in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Upon his arrival in Italy, Fontana was greeted as the deus ex machina of the Milanese art scene. Younger artists gathered around him, wrote manifestos, and recognized him as the initiator of a new phase of post-war Italian art. In particular, uh, these are some of the manifestos published, and uh, this famous photo shows the uh, spazialisti uh, who are linked through this uh, thread of light and Fontana orchestrates, right? They are emerging from uh, his, uh, his gesture. 
Uh, now, in the second, uh, in the second part, um, I'll uh, do a step back in time and compare Fontana and Cagli uh, during uh, the 1930s. So, uh, please, just a preliminary note, note that I'm not going to compare the two of them based on their stylistic choices. I'm interested in the similarities of their respective career trajectory vis-a-vis -vis the opposite reception that they encountered after the war. Uh, this comparison, I believe, helps us draw a line between what was deemed acceptable and what not in art, and how the Italians negotiated and defined that line of acceptability in the immediate post-war years. This process, I argue, played a key role in both the construction of memory and in determining new directions for the future of democratic Italy. Uh, Cagli and Fontana had stellar careers uh, in the 1930s. And uh, all those based in different cities, Cagli in Rome, Fontana in Milan, they occupied similar positions in the complex landscape of uh, fascist art. In their uh, small sized uh, work, here you see a small painting by Cagli on the left, this is uh, a ceramic sculpture by Fontana uh, on the right, they opposed the neoclassical revivalism and the heroic masculinity supported by the more conservative fringes uh, of the regime. They questioned hierarchies and blurred boundaries between fine and applied arts by working not only as painters and sculptors, but also as uh, ceramists, jewelry makers, and more. But this doesn't mean that they were anti-fascist. Actually, they embraced fascism as an anti-bourgeois revolution. Here on the left, you see one of uh, Cagli's um, um, uh, vases uh, celebrating the uh, march on, uh, on Rome as a kind of new mythology, uh, like a new kind of uh, uh, black uh, figure uh, um, uh, vases. Especially in their public art, uh, they were invested in the fascist rhetoric of national regeneration and in the role of art in constructing new values and new myths for a new society. Here on the left you see one of uh, uh, the frescoes that Cagli painted for the Triennale 1933, which was the moment when muralism became uh, a phenomenon. Cagli wrote a manifesto entitled Muria e Pittori, uh, which was uh, a call uh, to action. Uh, the one on the right is uh, a monument that uh, uh, Fontana designed with Renzo Zavanella, again to uh, the victory uh, in Africa. Um, they uh, pursued the so-called synthesis of the arts by promoting the collaboration between visual artists and architects. In particular, both artists collaborated with rationalist architects. This is, uh, uh, Cagli made the, uh, the mosaic decoration for uh, um, a fountain designed by uh, Ridolfi in Terni, and this is a collaboration between uh, uh, Fontana and uh, BBPR, uh, the same uh, um, uh, studio of architects we, we already heard about for the expo uh, in, uh, um, in Paris in 1937. Uh, um, and also they received support from major champions of rationalism it in Italy, people like Pier Maria Bardi, Edoardo Persico, and the gallery Il Milione in Milan, where both of them uh, exhibited. They both, um, they both had prominent positions at uh, major exhibitions like the 1936 uh, uh, Triennale in Milan and the 37 Expo in Paris as key proponents of the eternal civilizing mission of Italy from ancient war Rome to the fascist empire. Uh, this is one of the panels uh, that uh, Cagli made for the Paris Expo, which was dedicated to the history of Rome and of great Roman leaders, from uh, Romulus and Augustus all the way uh, to uh, Mussolini. Uh, so it's safe to say that they produced fascist propaganda, yet they were both criticized and even censored by the regime's more conservative leaders. During the second half of the 1930s, both Fontana and Cagli played active roles in galleries that um, were ambivalently supported but also censored by the regime. 
like uh, La Cometa in the case of Cagli and the Corrente in the case of uh, Fontana. In both cases, there were situations when they received money and support from the government, but also moments of censorship. The Cometa, for example, had its headquarters in Rome and branches in Paris and then uh, in New York. And uh, Cagli was the main artist promoted by uh, the Cometa. And uh, he, as the main artist of the Cometa, promoted an idea of uh, Italianita uh, that was uh, sensual and Mediterranean. Uh, this one on the left uh, is a painting uh, that Cagli exhibited here uh, in New York in 1938. Uh, and the reference is obviously uh, Cezanne, who had painted the uh, uh, subject of uh, card players uh, multiple times. But unlike the stiff and overly uh, dressed, covered, asexual bodies of uh, Cezanne, Cagli presents uh, sensual bodies in three progressive stages of nakedness. Uh, Cezanne presents them as self-absorbed and uh, alienated from each other, whereas Cagli makes them interconnected through their gestures and uh, gazes. So, in a way, this was part of the Italian um, antidote uh, to the alienations of, uh, uh, of modernity. Uh, Cagli was not only uh, the main artist of the Cometa, but he was also its de facto director. And as such, uh, Cagli organized the two shows of Fontana ceramics to be held respectively in Rome and in New York, including uh, works like this one reproduced here. But both uh, shows had to be canceled uh, when the regime forced the Cometa to close, calling it a bastion of Jewish and Bolshevik internationalism after having been funded by, uh, by the government. Um, both artists left Italy before the war, Cagli because he was Jewish, as we already heard, Fontana because he found better job opportunities in his native uh, country. He was born in Argentina, his father was a successful sculptor in Argentina and got him a job, uh, basically, uh, during the war. And then, as we saw, both returned to Italy after the war in 1947. But, and now in the third part I'm going to talk about the reception of Cagli when he goes back to Italy, which didn't go as smoothly as uh, uh, Fontana's uh, return. His, uh, Cagli's uh, first post-war shows uh, at the Roman gallery La Palma uh, was contested by the young abstractionist artist of the group Forma, who described themselves as Marxists and uh, formalists. Uh, this is uh, a, a painting of a couple years later by one of the main artists of, uh, uh, current, uh, of uh, Forma, uh, Giulio Turcato, and it's uh, uh, called uh, a political rally. Um, so at the, at the opening of Cagli, uh, the, uh, the Forma artist showed up uh, with uh, a poster reproducing uh, Cagli's work from the 1930s and calling him a fascist. The event turned into a fistfight, widely covered uh, by the press. Uh, here, Il Tempo talks about intermezzo sportivo, because people were, uh, were uh, really fighting. And as the following debate uh, revealed, a uh, former artist resented Cagli for being an outsider as much as for his fascist past. The former artist's letters to the press were filled with anti-Semitic, homophobic, and anti-American stereotypes. The problem, as I will argue, was not simply that Cagli was Jewish and gay, and uh, it was not simply that he was a former fascist, nor was the problem that, well, that Cagli was an American now, and that he had fought the war as an American soldier. The main problem was that, on top of being all of that, Cagli antagonized his Italian public by rejecting the formula of the tabula rasa, which we saw Fontana successfully uh, embraced. He presented his past as uh, a Jewish, gay, fascist artist, as well as an exile, and as an American soldier, as inevitably intertwined with any possibility to explore a future. Um, in, a, uh, in an article that he wrote in Harper Bazaar against the idea of the re new renaissance of Italy, 
he wrote, this is just a brief passage, the idea of a renaissance in Italy seems pompous and unreal. There has been no lack of continuity that would justify the necessity of the rebirth. The people were the same. They were all there in Rome, right? Um, in a series of drawings and paintings uh, from the post-war period, Cagli evoked the idea of uh, an, imagi an in imaginary atelier where past and present work coexisted. That space obviously could not exist uh, in uh, uh, real life, but it represented an ideal space and also his exhibition strategy uh, in the post-war moment. When he returned to Rome, Cagli presented simultaneously his pre-war paintings, his production during his exile in America and the military campaign in Europe. This is the cover of a book uh, of drawings uh, that he took as uh, a US uh, soldier published uh, in 1946. And also his current work, mostly but not only as an abstract artist. By doing so, he emphasized the multiplicity of constructed identity as inevitable consequence of persecution and displacement. So let's now look at the body of work uh, that Cagli unburied from the past and exhibited in post-war Rome. In the late 1930s, Cagli became the main target of the most conservative critics who wanted to import a German campaign against so-called degenerate art to Italy. Of course, the fascist regime is well known, had a more ambivalent relationship with, uh, uh, with modernism. But those who were against that kind of um, uh, ambiguity saw in Cagli uh, the uh, main enemy. Um, with the beginning of the most aggressive anti-Semitic and homophobic attacks, Cagli used the Jewish and homoerotic iconography to infiltrate the fascist rhetoric of heroism and continuity with the past. For example, he obsessively produced no less than 30 drawings and uh, uh, paintings on the theme of David and Goliath. Uh, here are two examples uh, reproduced in a moment when the Star of David became a symbol of exclusion. I mean, this is a famous cover from uh, La Difesa della Razza. By doing so, he did uh, two things at once. One, he claimed a crucial role for Judaism in the humanistic tradition that the fascist propaganda machine so much exalted. And second, he evoked the victorious Jewish king as a sort of amulet against the current persecution. Cagli had consistently used the homoerotic iconography in his work of the 1930s as an integral part of a new truly humanistic uh, fascist society. But during the exile, he used homoerotic iconography and strategies of irony to subvert fascist tropes of Italy, Italy's glorious artistic legacy and the civilizing missions. And uh, he did this uh, especially with a series of drawings called uh, allegories. The one you see here on the left is uh, a classicizing uh, statue of Saint Sebastian, which is being punctured uh, with a drill and turned into a fountain of blood, and it's called uh, the wrong fountain. Uh, and on the right, you see this kind of uh, uh, phallic uh, column that is being used as a, a useless uh, battering ram to break through the open door of an arch of triumph. Of course, the arch of triumph abounded in fascist Italy, but here it's turning to the Italian phrase of sfondare una porta aperta, right? A, a, a useless uh, uh, effort in this case. In um, other allegories, uh, here are two other examples, uh, Cagli alluded to the masochistic rhetoric of uh, military power that Cagli himself had helped construct. And now, of course, uh, we're going against him. Uh, this one is an archer who is uh, uh, being uh, uh, punctured by his own uh, arrows. Um, and uh, an interesting thing is that uh, uh, technically, also, uh, this was a meaningful operation. Cagli traced these images blindly by drawing with a metallic nail uh, on a white paper, which was pressed against uh, um, a leaf of dried oil paint so that the resulting marks would appear on the verso of the paper. So you would not know the result until, until you look back. So it was a surrealist-like device that he used to deconstruct 
didacticism and propaganda modes of communication, the overemphasis on uh, intention. And uh, many works of this period uh, used uh, data and surrealist strategies such as automatism and uh, collage as antidotes uh, against uh, hyper-controlled forms of persuasion. But then, during the war and the military campaign in Europe, Cagli returned to expressive figuration, actually a painstakingly representational uh, mode uh, of representation, to show the horror of war, such as bomb cities and concentration camps, like uh, here Buchenwald, he was uh, uh, with the, the American army uh, when uh, uh, they freed, uh, they, uh, they liberated uh, Buchenwald. And finally, in the immediate post-war period, he explored met a metaphysical way to, towards abstraction inspired by uh, De Chirico and uh, ideas of bodies and space, internal and uh, uh, external um, uh, spaces. So now you can imagine that when Cagli returned to Italy and presented all of this as the product of the same fragmented identity and as part of the same collective experience, the Italian public was not just disoriented, but disturbed. Not only did Cagli insist on presenting simultaneously his schizophrenic production uh, from the exile years, he also unburied his own fascist past quite literally so. Uh, unlike Fontana, we saw the photo of Fontana on top of the rubbles, right, of his studio. Um, unlike Fontana, who, on, who stood on top of the, his buried past, Cagli and his artist friends went where his uh, bomb studio was and they dug up uh, through the rubbles um, and uh, they retrieved the paintings, they restored the paintings, they exhibited them, some of them, they were openly uh, fascist paintings exhibited in the immediate post-war moment. Um, one of the artists who was part of this operation of uh, rescuing Cagli's old work was uh, uh, a painter, Toti Shaloya. And uh, he commented with, uh, even if he was involved, even if he was a friend, he commented with hostility towards Cagli in a magazine called Mercurio that he could not look at those paintings without being reminded of a foregone era, which had ended with the war. Those paintings that had seduced him once upon a time now look like dead to him. And he compared Kali's work, uh, which was barely 10 years old, to the shells uh, of a dead, uh, dead cicadas, or, uh, um, uh, crickets. And uh, he talks about uh, uh, those uh, paintings like uh, crickets, quote, they had sung and sung during a happy spring, and now they were hanging hollow, end of quote. And uh, he also compared the feeling of going there uh, and looking at those paintings to the act of entering the room of a party after everybody has left and someone has turned off uh, the light. Um, and in retrospect, uh, Shaloya's comparison to, uh, you know, spring and uh, the crickets and a party sound a little bit corny, but if we think that the spring and the party in his metaphor refer to fascist Rome in 1938, we really get a, a clear sense of how unsettling uh, Cagli's uh, operation was. Another case of unbearing the past uh, was the restoration of a mural that Cagli had painted back in 1953. Uh, sorry, in 1935. Um, this was uh, commissioned and made for the headquarter of the fascist organization Opera Nazionale Balilla in Rome. But when it was unveiled, the director of the Balilla organization deemed it too chaotic um, and expressionistic and ordered it to be washed out and destroyed. Some artists did, but made sure to make the process reversible. And so after the war, Cagli and other artists were able to restore the painting, bring it back to light. They organized an opening with the press and people writing about it, which is an incredible effort. Like in 1946, you restore a painting from the fascist moment. And uh, it's really an effort to not just unbury the, the past, the fascist past, but also to unbury 
the uh, ambiguity of fascist art patronage because the work had been commissioned but also censored by one of the prominent fascist organizations like Balila. I mean, these are things that scholars today are still really struggling to, to, to disentangle, to, to disentangle, and uh, already in the media post-war moment they were doing these kind of things. Um, before we close, I want to show uh, uh, briefly uh, a few works that Fontana actually made in Argentina and published in a monograph in Buenos Aires in 1946. Um, so right before he returned to Italy, uh, I just go through them rather quickly. And I bet most of you, I mean, myself included, didn't know about this until very recently. Um, the fact that this work disappeared from the exhibition history and the literature on Fontana is a deliberate choice of the artist, and it is part of the same strategy of the tabula rasa, which made Fontana's return to Italy so different than that of Cagli. Cagli, on the contrary, looked back at the recent past as a Jew, as a fascist, as an exile, as an American soldier, refusing to accept the idea of the tabula rasa. He presented himself as a simultaneously Ulysses and Polyphemus, as you see in these uh, two works, the main reason for the violent rejection of Cali's work were not only his stylistic choices or his fascist past. It was the fact that he forced the Italian public to engage in a frustrating effort to reconnect past and present and to reconcile multiple levels of constructed identity, an effort that post-war Italy refused to make. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much. I am Costantina Zano, I come from Columbia University and I brought all my class today um, to watch you because we are doing a class on uh, exile and diaspora, Itali in Italian and transnational exiles and diasporas. So my reflections will have to do with that and also um, to connect you with my students somehow. Um, so um, I really enjoyed these two uh, lectures. Um, uh, so I have some questions on, on, on the meaning of exile in these artists and their lives. So um, in, I will start from the second. Um, so I was wondering about uh, first um, uh, the uh, Fontana's relationship to his exile in Argentina, which we discovered actually that it was not an exile but a return to his half home. So it means that um, I was wondering if you, if you can speak more about uh, the meaning of Argentina, his dual uh, nationality somehow and identity before leaving for Argentina, whether this was important in his life. Um, I was wondering about the meaning of exile because he probably presented it because he hid these works as a gap, as something to be forgotten, as you said. Um, um, and um, you didn't tell us much about that period, I guess, because there is not much to say. So I was wondering whether in his case, exile could be viewed as a, a, a purification, a, a period which leads to, which purifies him and he can return back as a new man for a new age somehow. Now, in the cases of, uh, in the case of the other uh, Cagli, uh, it's very interesting. I find the fact that uh, I think that in his case, exile works is very much connected. Um, it became part of his marginal identity, of his queerness somehow, in the sense of being unconventional. And it, it kind of uh, uh, somehow um, represented all this. And then uh, th this may explain also why he... Um, exhibited so much of his exile period. And also he was an American soldier in his exile period. So he's not just an exile. He was actively a citizen of another country. Um, and the first talk was very, very, very important for me and my class <laughs> because it treated more openly with the idea of exile. And what I found very interesting is that Nivola, uh, discovered in the US, as you said very well, his Sardinian-ness, uh, and also his Mediterranean-ness, or uh, you mentioned his European-ness. 
Um, so we see somehow that he uh, is uh, in touch with either the very local dimension of his identity or the very regional. Um, I, I was wondering where is the place of Italy as a nation in his imagination and his work? Uh, how is his Italian and Italianness, if there is any, if we need to, t to see them as Italians necessarily, these uh, artists somehow? Um, and uh, finally, um, yeah, I really like the idea that exile, it may be all about how to rearrange your past and your present and your future. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> this is a lot of, um, uh, to think about. Um, thanks um, for the thoughtful um, question. Um, yeah, I would never, I would not define uh, Fontana's experience in Argentina as exile. Um, and uh, to be honest, I don't know how I would uh, deal with a definition of exile. That's why I was dealing mostly with uh, the artist strategies in uh, presenting uh, the recent past or uh, not presenting it. Um, so Fontana chose not to. Um, but uh, there is documentation and um, he was very attached to Italy. Oh, yeah, he was born in, in Argentina from uh, Italian parents. He was formed in Italy as, uh, as an artist um, and in many ways he considered himself an Italian artist. When he was in Argentina, in his letters, he complained about being stuck here in the middle of nowhere, which is not true. We know that he was very active, he was teaching, he had a circle of students. I mean, the Manifesto, Blan uh, Manifesto Blanco that I uh, showed you was actually not even signed by Fontana. It was his students who signed it, and uh, he then used it as... In Argentina? In Argentina, yes. Um, so he was uh, very active there, and also he was very active uh, in a more commercial kind of art. His father mostly worked for cemeteries, um, the funerary uh, sculpture, um, and uh, Fontana never made distinctions between what is decorative and what is fine art, so he did that, and he had uh, no problem with that. But he understood or he had an intuition in the post-war moment that that was not what was needed and uh, that ideas of uh, reconstruction uh, should only have a rhetoric of the future, which is rhetoric um, also because it was mostly based on his past uh, connections with futurism. So he was doing things that look futurist, that sounded futurist without naming it. Uh, so that's, uh, um, that's part of his, uh, of his choices. Uh, there is some scholarship being done now on Fontana's here in Argentina, and the, the Metropolitan Museum is organizing a show on Fontana, uh, which will give that phase of his uh, 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 life and work uh, some more uh, uh, space. Um, as, as for Cagli, um, he, um, he was, uh, if, if, we, if we want to use the term exile, probably that's really, he's like the perfect example of, uh, uh, of an exiled uh, person. He had to leave the country. He, he, uh, he didn't have uh, legal rights. He couldn't work uh, in Italy. Uh, he left his friends behind, and uh, especially through the correspondence, you get a sense of uh, um, the huge sense of loss. I mean, really, like, if you read uh, Edward Said's definition of exile and then read Kali's letter, that's exactly it. And uh, he talks about uh, Italy with a great sense of nostalgia, and he talks about painting as... Uh, um, a quintessentially Italian form of art. Uh, he, um, I, I didn't show those, uh, but uh, he made these drawings of uh, uh, saints who are lost in the uh, landscapes of Nevada of, or Oregon, and he was talking like 
I feel like Raphael, uh, who is all of a sudden in the uh, North Pole talking to penguins. That, that is uh, his literal uh, description of uh, being in America, which of course is not true, but he had this sense of uh, that was the kind of interlocutor and cultural context uh, that, uh, that he needed. But at the same time, uh, if we think of exile as uh, a process of constant redefinition of what is your interlocutor. Um, it's very interesting to see the trajectory of Kali when he was in the, when he's in the United States, in the sense that for him, art should be public, and uh, the artist has uh, um, a duty as uh, uh, as a as a public figure. Uh, the problem is that, of course, he was excluded from the collectivity he had believed in. Uh, he, he believed in the fascist project, so that's, that's a great... He had to leave, and for example, when then, when he's uh, a soldier, uh, uh, during his draft in uh, California and then, in, and then in, in the state of Washington, he found a new kind of collectivity. So for example, he made this uh, um, uh, mur I mean, new murals. They were made on wood on the barracks of the uh, military camps for his uh, peers. He made drawings for little <laughs> Uh, magazines uh, uh, of the uh, US, uh, US Army. And so that was a new level of uh, uh, co collectivity. And then as an American soldier, again, he, he found that he had a duty in uh, documenting and representing what he was experiencing. But then he decides to go back to Italy because still, despite everything, he saw Italy as his own context. So it's, but he, he chooses then to confront his Italian friends and the Italian public the way I, I, I described, which is hostile. Many of his good friends from the 1930s uh, found him unbearable. He, he really broke completely any kind of contact and relationship with them. Yeah. Um, before answering, can I say something about Fontana? I don't think we can speak of Fontana as an exile. Actually, it's not the sense in which uh, Raffaele uh, used uh, his example. It was very fascinating how he connected it to, to Cagli and how he constructed his, his um, argument. Um, because, uh, of course, Fontana wasn't obliged to, to, to leave Italy. He simply felt... Uh, went... went uh, uh, to work with his father, and then he became uh, trapped there because the communication were interrupted. So, just to close <laughs> this, uh, this parenthesis. Uh, speaking of Nivola, you said that Nivola uh, uh, discovered the Sardinia in the US. Actually, he was obsessed with Sardinia. <laughs> I mean, it was his constant uh, references, uh, um, it was always in his words, in his um, way of. Uh, uh, in his behavior. Um, for example, some friends of him were uh, actually um, annoyed by this. For example, uh, Steinberg who was a very close friend. Steinberg uh, used uh, to be very ironic. Uh, he did uh, some, funny, uh, some funny caricatures uh, of uh, Nivola. Um, Nivola, in a sense, uh, uh, self-primitivized himself. I mean, it, it tended to present, so Steinberg said, uh, Nivola uh, is just uh, come back from Italy uh, to live uh, as a civilized uh, pair. Um, no, sorry, uh, it just come back to Italy where, where he went to, be, uh, to live as a civilized person because here they live as people from Calabria. <laughs> he meant that uh, he and his wife uh, had moved to Long Island where they, they lived in contact with nature in a very simple, with a very simple lifestyle. So he was obsessed with, uh, with Sardinia. He has this strong sense of identity, which is not uh, um, uncommon, I have to say, because identity, um, I mean, I should speak of the Sardinian history. Sardinian was... Um, um, it was a backward region back in the early 20th century, and it was uh, kept by Italy in a sort of semi-colonial semi state uh, situation. So, um, in the early 20th century, a, a movement, a regional movement, developed there, 
uh, a, a regionalist party was created, the, the Partito Sardo d'Azione. One uh, of uh, the leaders was Emilio Lussu, who was the main political reference for Nivola. Emilio Lussu was uh, the leader of the Giustizia e Libertà movement, and Nivola came to uh, to meet him in Paris when he was working at the 1936 International Exposition. So he, he used to go and see um, clandestinely, clandestinely? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I am uh, uh, renovating English language. <coughs> anyway, um, he used to go and see, uh, and see Lussu, so he absorbed these uh, uh, profoundly regionalist uh, ideas. I use the, the term regionalist, but I should, I should say nationalist, because Sardinians uh, are convinced to be a nation. Still today we have uh, um, very conspicuous uh, uh, independentist movement in the island. So uh, this sentiment uh, uh, never went away, it just uh, resurfaced uh, more strongly, in a more strong way, in, in a stronger way in, uh, in America. Uh, then I have to say that Nivola didn't consider himself uh, Italian, and that is funny because uh, uh, as I said, uh, in Milan he lived very, very well. Uh, it was the first time in his life that uh, he had three meals per day, he said, when he was working at the Olivetti. He was a successful, uh, uh, very successful um, uh, graphic designer uh, already before leaving Italy. Probably if Nivola uh, had went back uh, to Italy after the war, his destiny would have been completely different. I think uh, he would have become uh, the interpreter of uh, the Olivetti's graphic, graphic image in the post-war years, a task um, and a role which was played by his fellow Sardinian and friend Giovanni Pintori, who invented the... But I think that um, it, is, it is likely that if Nival or maybe, I don't know, maybe there are two paths that he could have taken. One was this, a graphic designer like Pintori, or the other one was to follow uh, Fontana, which was another of his friends, on, uh, the, on the path that he pursued, not with the same talent. Maybe, I am not sure, but anyway, that was a possibility. Um, so Nivola didn't, didn't consider himself Italian, uh, he had a double identity and that was uh, American and uh, Sardinian. Uh, he said, I love uh, both uh, like uh, a wicked lover, come un amante scellerato. So I don't know if I answered. I want to congratulate you both, you know, for this uh, really magnificent lectures. You know, it was really great. And I have to be honest, uh, to consider myself very, uh, I was not familiar, very ignorant, actually, with these artists, because I was not really very familiar at all with them. And I think that is a great work that they both did. But I just want to point out something about the word exile, seems you both used the, you know, so often in this lecture, uh, exile is really used particularly for people, usually politicians, who are persecuted or people who are part of, of a, or a group or some sort of faction that they are being persecuted and they decide or they are forced for exile, both in their minds. Exile means that they go for a while whenever they problem is solved and they are coming back. The other use, the other, they say for people who really go leave their countries is usually immigration. They immigrate and this the idea of not coming back to whatever they left. But exile is basically what I just finished saying. People who are being or persecuted or being followed up by somebody so they have to really choose that well, the action of Xi with the idea of coming back to their original countries. Thank you. 
Uh, again, uh, I'm joining the audience saying that uh, those two lectures were really, really interesting and uh, there's so much to learn about that. And, but since also the, the series is not just Excel, but Excel and Creativity, I have a, a question regarding um, the, the style of, uh, of these artists and the fact that uh, I was wondering, for instance, in the case of Kagi, in the murals of the 30s, you said, uh, to me, they, they look like uh, they resemble a lot of another cosmopolitan artist that was Italian, but only, you know, but not by birth, like uh, like the Chirico, especially some stuff he was doing in the late 20s, uh, when the gladiators, and, and uh, so I was wondering whether this style, even though those, the Chirico paintings were not considered the best of the Chirico, the Chirico was over by then, uh, I wonder if that style that was in a way uh, a cosmopolitan international style was a um, was a thought with uh, what uh, uh, even the, um, the fascist first and the post fascist Italy wanted to see about their, their own arts. Because on one hand, it was going back to the roots of, of Italian art, to the myths, to the myth making, but on the other was a, a very very uh, idiosyncratic interpretation. And uh, and I have a question for you that's a bit different because uh, I'm very um, you answer regarding. Um, the connection that um, with uh, Emilio Lusso that was the, the leader, but I, I was wondering whether the, um, the Nivali was also uh, politically uh, connected, uh, besides with the Sardinia movement, with the Partito d'Azione, because uh, Emilio Lusso was uh, one of the great leader of, before of Giustizia e Libertà and then of the Partito d'Azione. So I wonder whether there was a political aspect, uh, even re even regarding his. Uh, refusal or rebuttal of uh, is, is Italian identity. <laughs> Very briefly, uh, yes, uh, uh, Nivola had political interest beyond his uh, regionalist commitment. Uh, actually, um, actually, in later years, first he was an anarchist, basically. Um, he was an anarchist when uh, first in the US he was in contact with uh, several uh, anarchist circles. Uh, some of them were, uh, were old immigrants, uh, anarchist uh, immigrants from the, early from the early 20th century. Uh, some others were more recent uh, refugees. So, uh, this, uh, anarchist faith uh, never uh, never disappeared i think uh, and it resurfaced in later years uh, when nivola went in contact with the more recent independentist uh, uh, independentist movement so he coupled uh, this anarchist uh, undercurrent with uh, his uh, regionalist independentist uh, thought. Um, in later years, uh, even uh, designed a series of drawings uh, on uh, about uh, the um, anarchist Skirru. Skirru was uh, an, uh, a Sardinian American, a Sardinian who had emigrated uh, to America and was an anarchist and went back in 1931 to Italy in order to kill Mussolini. He was discovered and uh, uh, condemned to death and uh, it seems that a special uh, battalion of soldiers was called from Sardinia in order to uh, rescue the honor of uh, Sardinian offended by his gesture. So Nivola identified with the Schierru. Nivola was Sardinian, was an anarchist, he lived in the US, he was an anti-fascist, so he put together all these elements to design uh, um, quite uh, um, a big series of, uh, large series of, uh, of works, uh, and this happened in the 70s, so there is a continuity in his political ideals. So. Um, yeah, the comparison with uh, uh, the Chirico makes perfect sense. Um, I don't know if uh, I would call it uh, cosmopolitanism. They were definitely uh, obsessed with Paris, uh, but uh, um, in a negative way. Uh, so uh, they, and I mean, this is not just the two of them, but uh, uh, there was this trope um, in uh, Italian modernist circles that uh, uh, the School of Paris had uh, uh, monopolized uh, the, um, 
gallery system and uh, museums and therefore the idea of uh, modern art, but that Italy had its own uh, independent uh, identity and its own way to, uh, to modernism, uh, which they were actively promoting. This said, they were of course going constantly to Paris, they were in touch, both uh, Cali and uh, De Chirico in different ways, in touch with the uh, environments uh, like the surrealists and, uh, um, and others. Uh, in the case of the Kiriko, of course, there is the famous uh, uh, hostility towards the surrealist after the surrealist declared him dead, right? The famously paraded the fake funeral of uh, the Kiriko uh, through the streets of, uh, of Paris. They rejected all of his post uh, uh, metaphysical uh, work. And so the Kiriko was looking for uh, and uh, of course he embraced the idea of their uh, return to craft and uh, he identified himself as uh, an old master. Uh, and uh, Cagli was much appreciated by the Chirico, especially um, when they came uh, to New York, uh, the Chirico is the one who uh, helped Cagli find uh, collectors and uh, exhibit his work. Um, he introduced him to uh, Julian Levy, uh, who's the prominent uh, uh, art dealer who brought surrealism to the United States. And Levy is the first one to uh, exhibit Cali's work in 1940. Those uh, allegories that I showed you, those drawings, they were exhibited at the, uh, the Julian Levy uh, Gallery. So uh, I think that uh, in the uh, 1930s, I mean, in the 20s, Cali was not active yet, but uh, uh, in the 30s, they were both uh, interested uh, in, um, defining a way that was not the Parisian way. Uh, but still, they could not accept the more uh, historical revivalism of uh, uh, the Novecento movement. Um, neither of them uh, liked uh, that kind of uh, uh, idea of uh, Romanità. Um, and then later, of course, they had a fight, but... <laughs> Buongiorno, mi chiamo Corrado Levi. Uh, io non ho capito, non, non, il mia, la mia comprensione del, dell'inglese non, non, non è così perfetta, quindi le cose che, che io voglio dire di Costantino Nivola, Nivola, come, um, forse, forse sono già state esplorate, eh, mi scuso in questo caso. Ho pensato molto al rapporto con Le Courbusier di Costantino Nivola, che non era soltanto un'amicizia, ma eh, secondo me è stata un'influenza reciproca, e forse, non so, mi domando se... La, la, eh, nel senso che dopo l'amicizia con Costantino Nivola, eh, Le Courbusier ha cambiato modo di fare architettura. Ronchamp non sarebbe immaginabile, pensando alla Ville Savoie o, o, o la o altre cose di, di Le Corbusier con di, eh, de Rochamp con dei muri spessi metri con delle finestrine piccole cose rispetto ai punti, quattro punti, cinque punti di Le Corbusier che erano stati il manifesto dell'architettura moderna eh, e, e Costantino Nivola essendo radicato nella mediterraneità non soltanto nel, nella, nel, nella Spagna, nel, nel, nella Sardegna come sa, in cui l'architettura non, è, non viene da, da questa tradizione razionalista, lontanissima, i tetti sono in curva, eh, c'è tutto un, un, e, e anche questo fatto di fare il casting con la sabbia, era, si, si presentava molto bene, si, si, era molto eh, adatto a fare delle forme più curve, più molli, più, più, e, e so che, che Le Corbusier eh, ha aiutato, si, forse lei l'ha detto, non lo so, eh, era, ha, ha sgranato gli occhi quando ha visto eh, Costantino Nivola che, che faceva queste cose sulla sabbia e poi li gettava, anzi pare che abbia aiutato lui a fare queste cose. E comunque il fatto di cambia, del cambiamento delle Corbusier, io sono architetto, lo conosco stato bene, mi ha sempre stupito e ho dato, ho dato la, la, la ragione, ho dato l'occasione che che lui ha capito che 
c'era altre cose al mondo, non c'era soltanto la linea retta e i suoi cinque punti, c'era delle cose che, che gli erano sfuggite nella vita e, e ha cercato delle ultime cose di Le Corbusier, con questo meraviglioso genio che, che, che è stato, di recuperare forse per l'influenza di, di Costantino, Nivola, eh, forse cose che lei ha detto, io mi scuso se ho ripetuto, ma non ho capito bene. ha detto <ride> perché effettivamente il cambiamento di, Nivo, eh, di, di Le Corbusier deve qualche cosa a Costantino Nivola eh, il suo mh, senso di artigianalità maggiore che compare nell'opera di Le Corbusier dopo l'inizio degli anni 50 sicuramente è dovuto al, mh, come dire, alla presa di confidenza con i materiali che lui aveva potuto avere nell'esperienza compiuta a Long Island accanto a, accanto a Nivola e non soltanto Le Corbusier ha aiutato Nivola o Nivola aiutato le Corbusier non so esattamente che cosa, non ricordo lei come abbia detto, ma eh, Le Corbusier ha imparato la tecnica del sound casting, nella sua œuvre complète dichiara il suo debito di gratitudine nei confronti di Nivola, Nivola è anzi l'unico artista di cui pubblichi un'opera, sia pure piccolina perché l'ego di Le Corbusier era talmente grande che non gli permetteva insomma, di dare eccessivo spazio ad altri artisti, però ehm, io credo che lui fosse grato e consapevole di quello che... Eh, da Nivola aveva potuto prendere. A questo proposito al Museo Nivola stiamo organizzando una mostra che inaugurerà a dicembre intitolata Le Corbusier lezioni di modernismo, Le Corbusier lessons on modernism, al Museo Nivola di Orani, ahimè, non è proprio a portata di mano, <ride> in Sardegna, il paese natale di Nivola. È... Ah, ok, mi farà molto piacere. <ride>